Hi, I'm Craig. Welcome back to the Libro FM podcast. And I'm Karen. On today's episode, we'll be speaking with Kendra Winchester, who is a contributing editor over at Book Riot and who also runs an organization celebrating Appalachian literature named Read Appalachia. We really had a great time getting to know Kendra and learning about our experiences with audiobooks, advocating for disability rights, and more. So why don't we keep this intro short and get right into it? We are so excited today for our guest, Kendra Winchester. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, And for those of you who aren't familiar with Kendra's work or maybe don't know about the myriad things that Kendra does, um, Kendra, we'd love for you to introduce yourself and tell us about all of the stuff you're doing in the the bookish world. Well, uh, until very recently, uh, I was podcasting uh, with Reading Women, and so that ended at the end of uh, December, 2021. And we had six wonderful seasons. And I'm also a contributing editor at Book Riot, where I write about audiobooks and disability and all sorts of things around that. And then I also have a project called Read Appalachia, where I feature books, um, by or about Appalachia and celebrate Appalachian writing. So I, I wear many hats. So yes. How do you find enough hours of the day to do all of these things? <laughs> Well, I will say after the podcast ended, I did have a lot more time <laughs> when you like get 50 to 60 hours of your work week back. Um, that's always nice. So did, did you yes. say 50 to 60 hours? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. It was, it was a lot because it wasn't just a podcast. We had, you know, the social media, which always takes a lot to manage uh, right. the newsletter that went with reading women all sorts of planning things. Um, I was the, uh, a co-host, a producer and the editor. So I just, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Was there, was there one of those jobs that you disliked the most? I can say that mine is editing. So I also edit the podcast and it's. Mine is also editing. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Like a million little snips, like, oh, I got to cut that sneeze out or, you know, that type of stuff. Yeah. We, (laughs) We got into the habit of apologizing to editing Kendra whenever we would make terrible, like just flubs or go off on a tangent. We're so sorry, editing Kendra. You have to cut five minutes of us going on about corgis being loud. Like, I love that. Um, <laughs> I want one of those cough buttons, like in old time radios, you know? Um, yes. Yeah. Yep. Well, and given that you are very busy, um, I know that you do love to consume audiobooks, though. Um, to fit that in, um, do you have any current listens that you'd like to share that you're really enjoying? Yes. Yeah, so I had just finished over the weekend, uh, Just by Looking at Him by Ryan O'Connell. And uh, first, I mean, you, listeners can't see this, but the cover itself <laughs> is delightful. Yes. Um, and so I. I picked it up because I'm reading for disability pride month. I'm prepping for that. So I'm always like a month ahead when you prep content. Um, And this is a book about a disabled gay man who's living in LA. He writes for TV uh, and he starts for whatever reason, starts cheating on his long time boyfriend. And he's trying to like figure out why he's self-sabotaging his life and it's imploding and it's about disability and intimacy, particularly in the intersection of being a gay disabled man. Mm. And it was just, it, it really talked about questions around disability and sexuality that I'd never seen tackled before. And by the end, I was just crying and he performs the audio book, the author does. And so it's perfection would recommend. You just mentioned that that he performs the audiobook himself. And I was actually curious, what are your thoughts on that in general? I feel like I really like when authors read their own work, but it can be hit or miss sometimes. When they're good, they're really good. And when they're not, you're like, Ugh, I kind of wish they would have hired a professional, you know? Yeah, I think that's always, I mean, that's always the, um, it depends on like, as you said, the the author, are they good at reading? But also I think that typically they're better at nonfiction. So if they're writing their own memoir, it's mm-hmm. their narrative voice. While with fiction, you have to inhabit a character. And since this author is also an actor, it really worked very well. And I would just laughed out loud, like for the first quarter of the book, because this guy is getting himself in worse and worse, worse situations of his own making. <laughs> and I just died. It was, it was great. <laughs> 
Well, I can't wait to read this now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Immediately when we get off of this, I'm yeah. going to be putting that on the app. <laughs> this is this is the problem with the Karen and I doing the podcast is that our to be read list just keeps growing and growing as we do each episode. <laughs> um, so I don't know when we're going to find the time, but um, well, this might be a good segue into talking about audiobooks. So um, on the on the socials and the internet, you're obviously very um, excited about audiobooks and talk about it and write about it. And I guess I was just curious, like, how did you get into audiobooks more so than, I mean, I saw you obviously had that print book, but what about audiobooks like resonates so much with you that, that you've like started to write about it and advocate for them? And yeah, I, I grew up, um, as a chronically ill kid, my brother and I are both disabled in that we have migraines and we've had them, um, since probably since we were born. Um, apparently it's genetic and we went to a specialist for a long time, for those. And I didn't realize this, but when I started to learn to read, I was getting migraines and learning to read is hard enough as it is, but it took me a long time for it to really click. And that's because I was having to push through migraines. And I didn't know that as a kid, because you don't know that learning to read isn't painful. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, yeah. you're not talking to all your friends about this. And so we figured it out much later, but uh, my mom would then just get us a uh, books on cassette. And so she gives these little tape players and we kept them in our bed and we are by the bed and we would fall asleep listening to them. And we would just listen to the same like dramatizations of little women or a Christmas carol <laughs> or whatever. And as we got older, uh, I remember my mom, like when I was 11 or 12, introduced me to the left behind series on audio and Frank Muller first audiobook crush of a voice ever. <laughs> he uh, just did such a great job. I remember cr actually crying when he had his motorcycle accident and couldn't finish the series. And I was horrified for him, but also he couldn't finish the series. And I hated the new narrator. I don't even think I finished the series because I hated the new narrator so much. <laughs> um, but that's really how it started. And once we figured out what was going on, my mom was much more proactive in getting me audiobooks, And we upgraded to CDs eventually. Uh, and uh, then overdrive happened and I could have them on my computer, the desktop at home. And uh, it, it was just really, you know, eventually you got LimeWire, of course, and you could yep. put them on your iPod. <laughs> so you, know, you put like two CDs on your iPod because there was such a little storage space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that was really how it started. And I've just, you know, used them as an accessibility tool and for enjoyment, both um, ever since. I love that journey through technology and audiobooks <laughs> yeah. from cassette to, to uh, lime wire to where you are now. Um, that's great. I mean, it's one of the reasons I, I mean, I, I also love audiobooks for a ton of different reasons, but I, I love that it makes reading accessible to whether it's you can't read for very long because you get migraines or whatever the, whatever your reason is. Um, it's, I mean, I love it. It's, it's great to hear that. One of the topics I was really excited to talk to you about, you mentioned earlier um, the Read Appalachia project that you clearly started and are responsible for. And um, I am from that area. And so I was really interested in learning about where this came from and, and what the scope of it is. Um, anything that you can share with us, I'll be thrilled to know. <laughs> yeah. So I'm from Scioto County, um, Ohio. So that's, um, if you look at the very bottom of Ohio, there's that point at the end. If you just go slightly to the left, it goes back up into the state. And so Scioto County is this weird wonky looking arch kind of county. And uh, my family is originally from Higby, Ohio, which is south of Chillicothe. Um, but you know, my family has been there for about eight generations or so, which I just recently figured out. I don't know. I'm, I'm a history nerd and like genealogies. But uh, so growing up there, though, because it was on the Ohio side, um, I didn't really think of myself as Appalachian, right? It was just, you know, this big divide in my family. We're kind of like um, dual citizens of Kentucky and Ohio from where the family has grown up and, and jumped back and forth and moved. And when I, you know, got down here to South Carolina, it was, the culture shock was super intense uh, because you go from a working class rural place to a new South where there's more money, more middle class. I realized the people who were like rich where I grew up were actually like lower middle class here. And it was just a lot. So uh, it was a process of learning that. And so when I moved out of the region, so when I moved down to the low country, 
like four hours away from um, where I went to college, I was homesick. And so I started looking through bookstagram, like you do, looking for an account that just featured read, you know, Appalachian literature. And there wasn't one. So I got on Canva and I created a little logo and started one. And it's kind of grown from there. Um, it's been a really wonderful experience. I didn't expect anyone to really follow it a ton, but it's really gotten a lot of great feedback, which I really appreciate. Has there been, you mentioned there was a lot of wonderful experiences or any that stick out to in your mind as like, um, you know, throughout doing this, this project that have really been like a special experience for you? I really love getting to know other people from Sayota County who've moved away. So we, we called expat Appalachians, um, the, the diaspora that moves away, which is kind of an Appalachian tradition, unfortunately is moving out. And so I found other people from my County, um, who are also now, you know, have a similar, uh, desire to spread more diverse literature about the region. And so that's been really nice. Amanda Page, who is the head of Sayota Literary, is it's a nonprofit that encourages like the arts in the area of Sayota County. And she had a documentary come out. And so my mom and I went to the premiere. Um, I went back home and we went to the premiere of the new documentary about Portsmouth. Um, uh, it's, it was really great. And I don't know, just getting to better understand where I come from. Um, Appalachian culture is very unique and a lot of people don't understand like why it's, why people are so, I don't know, kind of why we're so proud of our heritage in a way, because they're like, oh, isn't that just like being Southern or being Midwestern? Like, well, not, not really each is unique. Right. Mm -hmm. So I've really enjoyed just meeting other people. Um, also I met, uh, Garrett, who is now Reed Appalachia's intern. He's also um, a neurodivergent Appalachian. And so we are on the same wavelength. And um, so he has a lot of great reviews. So um, people could definitely go check those out. And yeah, so he also loves audiobooks because of course he does. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am so excited about this because I, I feel like I encounter curation around this region more in terms of like music like you see a lot of that but I hadn't seen a curation around the written word and you also have this book right article where you curated audiobooks um, from the region which is so exciting um, so we'll make sure to share that with everyone after the episode because it's an, an incredible list <laughs> and the accents are really hard for narrators to get and it's really <laughs> interesting uh, to when you hit, when I hit play, cause I don't really have a choice. I can't read print. So I'm like, um, am I going to have to like, tr you know, chug through this? Like what, what is happening? And so sometimes <laughs> it's good. Sometimes it's not great. And sometimes you can tell they just did the best they could and that's fine. But, um, I really like when authors read their own audiobooks in that case, um, because the accent is so important. Like Silas house reads a lot of his own audiobooks and he has the most beautiful voice and accent known to humankind maybe neil gaiman <laughs> might be him but neil gaiman was going to be the author i was going to suggest earlier when we were talking about <laughs> authors that read their own books that do it really well i feel like he sticks out as just like man i don't want anyone else to ever read his books <laughs> um so speaking of that that playlist i was also taking a look at that earlier if there was like one audiobook on that list that for someone that's never read or listened to books in this genre um, by authors from that region is there like the quintessential first read that you would recommend? Yes. So I would recommend Same Sun Here by Salas House and I think it's Neela Vaswani. And that is a middle grade book and it's epistolary. So it's these two kids. Uh, a girl has recently immigrated from India to the United States and she lives with her family in New York City. And she's writing as a like a pen pal situation to this young boy named River who's from uh, Eastern Kentucky. And they, you know, Silas reads River's portions and um, Neela reads you know, her portions. And it, it's an incredible audiobook because it's the accents and their work together to create this story. It's so incredible. And I feel like if you're coming from outside the region, you are going to con probably connect, you know, with one side or the other, but it'll help you introduce you to the region. Because I think a lot of people are at like, why should I read Appalachian literature? Like, why is it so important? And I think that book is a great introduction. Awesome. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, so again, thanks for joining our podcast, especially as someone who used to podcast a ton. So I was hoping that we could actually talk about your, your time um, with the Reading Women podcast a little bit. For people that may not be familiar with the podcast, if you want to give us like a like a one minute little refresher on, on what it was. And, um, that would be awesome. Yeah. So reading women, uh, is with lit hub radio and they still have all of the backlist up there. So you can still go listen to it. Um, but it started back in 2016 when a friend and I created a podcast to talk about literature with our friends from grad school. We had just graduated with our, our master's in literature and we started it and it was just, it was just us. It wasn't like anyone else. And so we just kind of started for fun. And then we kind of stumbled into author interviews in 2017. So in the second season, and it just kind of grew from there. And then eventually we had a lot of different contributors and um, co-hosts and, you know, it went for six seasons. We had the reading one award, there was a newsletter and we had a Patreon with like bonus episodes and it was just a lot of fun. It was a great project to work on. Um, a lot of work, but a definitely something that I will treasure for a long time. Cool. Were there any sort of standout episodes for you? Um, you know, whether it was an interview that you did with a particular author or just a book that you reviewed, was there anything that kind of, you know, would make your top 10 list of episodes? I really enjoyed Min Jin Lee's interview. We interviewed her as one of our first guests. And a lot of people don't realize that Min Jin Lee's book, when it first came out, didn't have much of a marketing budget. So she was doing all of this on her own. And so she was just taking whatever interviews she could get. And then eventually it did take off and she sold a gazillion copies of Pachinko. Um, but during that interview, my audio files failed three times. <laughs> No, <laughs> So I had to piece together this interview and it was a great interview. So I'm just like grabbing pieces. Autumn's mic died like mid recording. And it was, it was a whole, it was a whole saga. So that one sticks out in my mind for those reasons, um, for sure. And we did also would do themes every month. And so we'd read on that. Um, I was able to interview Rosemary Ketchum, who is um, the first elected trans woman in the state of West Virginia to like any official office. And that was really cool. Um, interviewed Lee Bardugo, um, nice. yeah. another co-host. It was, it was just really great to just meet all of these people. I think that was my favorite part. I think that's one of, I mean, I, I won't speak for you, Karen, but I think that's one of our favorite parts too. So far we're only a few episodes in, but we do have like a bunch of episodes scheduled out with some amazing authors that we're super excited to talk about. So I'm Glad to hear that that was a shining moment for you as we have this, <laughs> we have a similar thing coming up, hopefully. Um, yeah. yeah. It's hard not to fangirl, honestly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that is, that was my biggest problem because I just like would just be thrumming in the background and we didn't yeah. use video at all. So I was so glad about that because I just looked like a complete, just, it was just gone. You know, <laughs> I was just a complete fangirl and that would have been even more embarrassing than it already was. We have a couple we have a couple authors on our schedule that I think that will be me when we're talking to them. So maybe that will be a video off episode. Transparently, I'm having that moment now. I've been so excited to talk to you. And three minutes before I clicked the Zoom link, I was like, oh, I'm really, I'm like hot. I'm very nervous. I'm like, I hope I can keep it together. So, <laughs> oh, Well, thank you. I'm, I'm, we're very chill here. You know, we have corgis screaming in the background and I just ran in here trying to get them to go potty before the storm. And so I'm just like, so we're, we're all the same here. <laughs> real life, real life is happening all around us. <laughs> what are your, what are your corgis names? So Dylan is, uh, the Pembroke Walsh corgi. So the red and white, and his name is Dylan Excalibur, Lord of Winchester, because he is, he's very extra. And Gwen is a cardigan Welsh corgi. So the corgi with the tails, uh, and, uh, she is 11 months old and she is um, Gwenlian Tailwind, Lady of Winchester. Um, <laughs> she is from Arkansas. And I am, you know, we try to disrupt stereotypes of mountain people, uh, but unfortunately she is one. Uh, so she is an Ozark <laughs> Korg through and through, eats dirt, <laughs> loves playing in mud, will dig holes and just wallow in them. Bless her little soul. So... <laughs> They sound perfect. <laughs> yeah, my little Southern gentleman and my wild child. <laughs> so I was just 
getting back to the podcast a little bit. So there's a lot of book podcast. Um, when we were deciding if we were going to start this or not, you know, we did a little bit of research and there is a wide world of book podcasts. And I was just curious as someone that's been, you know, working with book riot and your, your reading women podcast and all of that. Like, what do you think like podcasting like means to the book industry? Like you mentioned how, um, that author was, didn't have any marketing budget, but you know, they like found lightning and they sold a bunch of books. Like I know a lot of book um, authors now are getting popular on TikTok and podcasting. And I'm just curious if you've thought about, you know, what that, what it means to the book industry. I think it's really important that just average people can have their opinions out there. And I think, you know, different mediums do different things. Uh, but for just your average person, if you don't have an indie bookstore, for example, I know a lot of influencers have like book, you know, book clubs with their local bookstore in major cities. It's very common and it's a great partnership between an influencer and an indie bookstore to get them, you know, support the indie bookstore. But if you don't have an indie bookstore, like where I grew up, uh, you're not going to have those very casual conversations with someone, you know, with a particular author. So I think that podcasting allows that, that you can get to know a host and get to know them and their personality and then have them interview authors you're interested in learning more about. And I think that is great because I feel like growing up, a lot of the bookish influence was from cities and was from these major places that I couldn't physically go to. And so I just didn't have that, that magic growing up of having an indie bookstore or having a place to go. It was just my library, right? And librarians are overworked and underpaid already. They didn't have time. Like no one's going to go to Portsmouth and be like, here, let's have an author event for like three people, you know? <laughs> right. So right. that's why I think podcasting is great because you can have that exposure and that experience in rural areas. Yeah. I think sometimes I, so I've always grown up in a city and I think that I um, forget how lucky people that grow up in, in cities are. Like I have, I don't know. There's a ton of like local independent bookstores in my area. So it's, it's something I've never thought about not having access to that and how things like, you know, whether it's, you know, book, bookstagrammers or, or podcasters, like kind of open up that world to people that may not have access to, you know, local author events at their, at their bookstore and all that. So it's a, it's a really good point and something I haven't thought of before. Last thing on the podcast. So this is our third episode. Um, so for people that are relatively new to it, do you have any advice or wisdom from your six seasons of, um, of working on a podcast? I would say there are so many, there's so many podcasts out there. I feel like it can feel overwhelming to try to differentiate yourself. For me, what was different was that no one else had my exact team, right? So you, there's only, this might sound like, I don't know, rainbows and sunshine, but there's only <laughs> one of you, right? And just being yourself on a podcast, it just goes a long way because you're unique in that there's only one of you and there's only one combination of both you as co-hosts. So ask the questions that you want to know. Ask the questions that if you had the opportunity to sit down with this author, which in fact, you do because you're recording a podcast with them. Ask the questions you want to know, and they might seem quirky or just out there, but I think that that goes a long way. And then as you podcast, you'll relax into it. And you might always have the jitters before you talk to an author, but you will feel more confident in your ability to ask questions and and to like go on, you know, through that and then ask the follow ups. So it just practice makes perfect, but don't feel like you have to there's really like a no you should do kind of um way about it you just do what you want to do if that makes sense because you're always doing what you think you should do then you're always not going to be completely yourself yeah i mean that's i mean that's always the hard part even for me as i'm thinking about these next episodes we have coming up is thinking of questions that not only i want to know but that i think listeners will want to know and that haven't been asked to this author 500 times over in other <laughs> interviews they've done. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think with <laughs> podcasting, you have a, you know, you have a great niche, right? Because you're talking about audiobooks and how someone's book, you know, plays out on an audiobook is a totally different experience than just yeah. print. So you're going to be like, you know, talking to, um, was it, is it Sarah Novich that did True Biz? Is that the author? 
I think that sounds right. <laughs> the author of True Biz, she had to do like all of this extra stuff for her audiobook because it's a story about a deaf community, right? So how do you take that and turn it into an audio? And so what she would do is she signs, there's italics of them signing a conversation. She signs during that, those sections. So you can hear it in the background. You can hear the signing in the background. So you know that these words are being spoken or being spoken through sign. Wow. That's, it, it that's is Sarah Novick. I just looked it up and never heard of that. And absolutely. I'm going to go listen to that now. Um, see, this is what we're talking about, about the to be listened to list, just growing and growing. Yes. Um, <laughs> well, and that's a great segue to one of the things I wanted to talk to you about. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, that it's disability pride month in July. Um, and while Craig and I were prepping for the podcast, we watched a YouTube video that you made, I think a year or two ago um, in preparation for disability pride month. Um, so we were wondering if you could just share some more about what that is, um, how you're involved in, um, and what that month means. <laughs> Uh, so Disability Pride Month is always in July because in 1990, on I think it's July 26th, uh, the United States passed the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is the first really piece of legislation of its kind. Uh, there, you know, it, what that does is guarantee it's supposed to is functionally the doesn't work out this way per se, but functionally it's supposed to protect a disabled person's right to enter buildings, to have, you know, disabled bathrooms, you know, uh, parking lots have to have you know, disabled parking and you have to have certain units and apartment buildings that are accessible to disabled people. You're supposed to have elevators in these buildings and all of this stuff that wasn't protected before your child, your disabled child was not guaranteed a public education up until this point. And granted, there's a lot of problems still going on now, but this was still fundamental legislation. So now we have disability pride month and it's not nationally recognized. Typically, it's just certain cities recognize it. So there's parades in major cities and different things, but it's kind of catching on online, which is great. Uh, and so you just, it's like, it's like, you know, Queer Pride Month, it's just Disability Pride Month. And we have our own flag, which is really cool. It's black and it has these like lightning bolt colors representing the different communities within the larger uh, disability community. And um, yeah, I, I feel... I feel like it's something that a lot of people don't know exists, right? And so for me, it's incredibly important to try to get that out there, particularly in the audiobooks world, because audiobooks are first and foremost an accessibility tool. And this will not be a surprising follow-up question, but um, do you have any reading recommendations for folks who, uh, I guess we're in June now, so when people hear this, it might be <laughs> the midst of July, but um, for people who are preparing for Disability Pride Month and want to learn more. Yeah, I would say um, demystifying disability is a great intro because it kind of defines terms and it's a very brief overview. It's only like a hundred and I want to say 150 pages. I don't know. I listened to it, so I'm not entirely sure, but um, it breaks everything down and gives you categories and do's and don'ts and etiquette. Like, for example, you never, never, never walk up and grab someone's wheelchair, even if you're trying to help them. You, they're, no, you don't, because that's basically an extension of their body. So you are going up and essentially grabbing what they consider part of their body. And so that's something that a lot of people don't realize, for example, um, and just general info about the disability community so that you can educate yourself and just have a base understanding of the different communities within the broader disability community. And I, don't know, I just found it very helpful. I, I want to send it to all of my friends um, who aren't disabled to be like, here, try <laughs> this. <Required> reading. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We'll add it in the show notes. Um, I did just look it up on Libro. It's it's about four and a half hours. So so it's pretty, I mean, in the grand scheme of audiobooks, that's a pretty short listen, which is nice. Um, we also read um, Disability Visibility um, as like our internal, we have like an internal like Libro staff book club. And we read that and then had the, the author. Um, oh no, actually we didn't have the author come for that one. That one was just an internal book club actually. Um, but I thought that was a really good one too, because it covers such a wide range of disabilities. It's a really good, like if for me, I thought kind of like a first book. Um, so it's not just like super narrow on one particular thing. It's pretty all encompassing, which I, I, I found that book to be really like an educational and interesting read personally, but yeah. Yeah. Agreed. And the editor of, of that book, Alice Wong, she has her memoir coming out in the fall oh, and great. Alice Wong does have her own podcast where she interviews disabled people and she will interview 
people from a wide range of disability backgrounds. Um, she's even done a, an interview in translation once and uh, just all sorts of things. And I really appreciate her because in every part of the of her publication process for disability visibility, she centered disabled people. So even the narrator is disabled. And that was really important to me. Yeah, absolutely. And I think she does, she doesn't read the audio. Um, Alice Wong doesn't read the audio book, but she does do like the intro to the audio book, mm-hmm. which was, is a, it's pretty power. It's like a powerful intro. It really sets yeah. the book up really nicely. Um, so I definitely, we'll put both of those books into the show notes as like a primer. Um, yeah. And I think I, for me, audiobooks are, you know, there's always this discussion that happens every few years when a new round of people discover audiobooks for the first time. Can't hear the air quotes. Sorry, <laughs> um, <laughs> discover. Um, and uh, they're like, oh, do audiobooks count as reading? And I, I really dislike that question because you would never go up to someone who is visually impaired or blind since you're seeing them read braille, you don't be like, oh, is that actually reading? Right. That, yep. that makes you feel really gross, right? That very question being voiced yep. makes you feel gross. Well, that's how I feel every time I see someone ask the question, are audiobooks reading? Because that's implying that the accessibility tool isn't fundamentally there to help people read. And that it's just really, I just... I just cringe every time. And even my spouse, whenever he hears someone ask me that question in public, he'll look at me like, please don't explode. Like, oh, please no. don't explode <laughs> on this poor unsuspecting person. But um, that's why like, I think the audiobooks are so important is because it creates a wider accessibility. And I'm so happy that other people are discovering them and pumping money into the audiobooks economy so more innovation can happen, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, I wish more non-disabled listeners would center disabled people in their conversations around the medium. When uh, that's actually, I think, an important point, because we see that come up all the time, too. Right. People saying like audiobooks don't count as reading and that it's cheating when their people are adding audiobooks they listen to to their like, you know, story graph reading challenge or whatever. Um, when people say that, do you have like a good response to that, like to to be like, actually, uh, as someone that like, you know, your husband looks at you like, please don't explode. <laughs> like, what does that conversation look like in a non-explosive way? Well, I think a lot of people don't think about audiobooks as uh, an accessibility tool. You know, um, it's it's like if some non-disabled person discovered they liked, you know, using a wheelchair for fun right? There's always some kid doing that, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. They don't understand that it's accessibility tool. And for me, it feels like audiobooks, like people have discovered audiobooks are fun for them, which is great. I love that they love them, but that's not centering the purpose that they were made for. So usually I talk to them, like, do you know that it actually, the information all goes to the same place? Like, I can't remember which ones I've read in print and which ones I've listened to at this point. Yep. And uh, just trying to engage with them because I don't also part of ableism in the disability realm, part of that uh, is that people don't think about disabled people, right? Most of the time I get reactions like, oh, I never thought about that. And I'm like, I can tell, I can tell you've never thought about that. That is, that is apparent. Um, and that that's typically how it goes. If people don't know, that's fine. And I, I tell them, they're like, oh, okay, that's great. You know, you don't have to be perfect, but just like Lizzo changed the, you know, lyrics of her song, she's like, oh, I didn't realize I will fix this. Yep. That, that's all you have to do. You don't have to feel terrible about yourself. You didn't know. And now if you keep saying ableist things about audiobooks, then we'll have a problem, but. Cool. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's all we had. Um, thank you so much for. Thank you. This has been wonderful. <laughs> Yeah, I have so many good book recommendations. I know what to say the next time someone says audiobooks aren't reading. Yes. Um, <laughs> They're one of those like uh, Libro FM t-shirts at their head, you know, that say audiobooks are reading on the back. All down the well, back. We, we also have times, enamel. Yeah. <laughs> we also have enamel pins. Those might be better oh. for chucking, you know. Like, <laughs> yeah, you had those. Oh, yeah, we we'll, can, have, we'll, we'll hook we'll you up. We'll send you some. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I have, yeah. I, I love enamel pins. 
I'm... Yeah, we have a little, we have a little, it's like a little book and it's, I, th- I forget the exact words it says, but it's something like audiobooks are reading or something like that with like Libra up the spine or something. We'll, <laughs> we'll ship, we'll ship one out to you. Craig and I, I feel like we were responsible for the pins. Craig and I both wear jean jackets with pins on them and we were like, <laughs> gotta, gotta make a pin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, every, also like every queer person has a jean jacket with pins. And so that probably is very popular right now. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When you come out as queer, they just give you one actually. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's part, part of your the starter pack. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess lastly, um, what's, what's coming up for you? Do you have any, I know you have disability pride month and you're putting some stuff together for that, but is there anything that listeners should be on the lookout and, you know, from you? Yeah. So I'm doing a series of posts for book riot, um, about like a book lovers guide to disability pride. So I have the intro, which is what is it? Here's the flag flag means here's some basic links. You can go find book recommendations. I'm doing an essay on, um, reading disabled literature and how that's going to be different than just reading literature, like learning to uncenter yourself as a non-disabled person when you read disabled literature and understand the differences in that. Um, I'm also doing like a disability 101 list. So it includes demystifying disability and disability visibility and, and talk about things that people can focus on. So I'm doing a bunch of, I guess, educational posts for Disability Pride Month. And, you know, Disability Pride Month is first and foremost about celebrating people with disabilities, not about educating non-disabled people. But I've never done any sort of series like this before for education. So I thought this might be a good year to do it since I had more time this year. So um, I'm excited about those and include lots of recommendations because I only listen to audiobooks. So, you know, I do about 200 a year, I think. Wow. So double speed. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> I, that was my follow-up question. What speed setting do you, do you use to consume 200 audiobooks? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I start 1.5 to get used to the narrator and get into the groove. And then I just up the speed as I move along. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm very impressed. I'm a, I'm a serial 1.3 person any I'm faster about, i'm yeah. like you know so i mean i'm very <laughs> impressed at anyone that can go higher than 1.5 so with time you know it's just a young padawan it will it will happen <laughs> you just gotta gotta ease into it <laughs> uh, well thank you so much kendra this has been uh, it's been really great getting to know you and hearing about everything you have going on we really appreciate the time well thank you for having me Yes, we'll, we will excitedly keep an eye out for everything that you're working on and, and share it far and wide. So thank you for, for everything that you're doing. <laughs> well, thank you. It's been fun. Thanks for listening to this month's episode, everyone. Next month, we'll be interviewing an amazing author. So if you've been enjoying the podcast, please be sure to subscribe so you know when we release the next episode. Also, if you have a spare minute, please rate the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. It would mean a lot to us. As always, thank you for listening. And if you haven't tried Libro yet, sign up using promo code LibroPodcast to get an extra free credit when you start your membership. Thanks again and talk soon.